All right, getting down to it. Drum roll, please. Can you guess what my number one is for this list? I bet you can. And if you can't, be prepared to kick yourself in about five seconds. Welcome and welcome back, everybody. Tia here. And in today's video, I'm going to be sharing an update on my top 10 favorite solo games. So a quick disclaimer before we get started, because how could it be a top 10 video on this channel without one? But I have made a previous video of my top 10 favorite solo games, which you'll find up in the card or down in the description if you haven't seen that yet, as well as talked about some of my top 10 favorite solo flexible games. But being that the year is 2022, I figured it was time for an update. So these are not my overall top 10 favorite solo games of all time, but rather 10 games that I've discovered or fell in love with over the past year that I think that you all might enjoy as well. So if you've been around on the channel, you probably have some guesses about which games those might be. Feel free to leave them down in the comments below. But without further ado, let's get started. Coming in at number 10 is a small Matchbox game from Thundergriff Games, and that is EO from their Matchbox collection. In EO, you are going to be playing as a samurai defending against hordes of enemies. The game is set up such that you're going to be running through a deck of weapons in order to combat enemies and gain honor points. These enemies will be placed out into a grid and weapons will dictate which of those enemies you can target each round based on their location in the grid. This is a really interesting game because it's almost like walking a tightrope the entire time. There's such a fine line between when you want to attack enemies and take them out to get the honor points versus stunning an entire group of enemies so that you don't take damage that round. You're going to be running through your weapon stack, which is basically your health over the course of two rounds, and then going into the final round, something really interesting that I hadn't quite seen before. There's a little bit of a push your luck element. So you have to spend previously one honor points to build up how many weapons you're going to have in your deck for that final third round. So you have to take into account how many honor points you've already accumulated, how many enemies are left in the deck, and how many weapons you think you'll need in order to defeat them while also maintaining a balance of having enough honor points by the end of the game to win and have a certain distinction. So there's a lot of tension throughout. You really have to pay attention and keep track of what you're doing and mediate between all of these different little choices. So out of the five Matchbox games, all of them have solo play, but EO is the one that was designed specifically for solo play and has a two player variant. This was the last one I tried out of the entire box. I think I played through all of the other four games almost immediately, and it took me probably over a year to get this to the table. And I'm so kicking myself because it's amazing. Like I said, that fine line tightrope, that tension of like, ooh, is this the right choice? I don't know. You have so much agency over what happens throughout the game. And then that last push, it's like a lot of calculations, just kind of building up the adrenaline until you just like bust through and see how you did. It's got a really cool game progression like that. And it's not something that I've really seen too much in other games, whether they're solo or not. And I have to say the theme and art, like, I don't know if you guys know who Lulu is from Final Fantasy X, but if you know, them, you know. But overall, this is just such a really unique little treat of a solo game, and it comes in such a compact little box. So that is EO from Thundergriff's Matchbox Collection. Next up on the list is a game that I couldn't conceive of how it would work, and it's one that's quite popular in a lot of solo board gaming circles but that is Black Sonata. If you're not familiar with this game, throughout the course of the game, you're going to be traveling through various parts of England, trying to track down and deduce who Shakespeare's Dark Lady is. When I first heard about this game, my mind went to Letters from Whitechapel, which was one of the games that I really enjoyed earlier on in my board gaming career. I like the idea of hidden movement. Do I have the best memory? No. Am I that great at deduction? No. But that style of game really appeals to me. So the idea of putting that into a small solo game sounded cool, but I couldn't understand how it would work. The main mechanic that makes this work out is that you have a deck of cards that will give you clues about the location that the Dark Lady has been to or is going to. And you also have these location cards that have a little hole punch cut out of them. So once you think you're in the same location as her, you'll overlay those two cards, flip them over, and if her silhouette is showing, that means that you've made contact with her or you're in the same town as her and you're going to get clues to figure out who she is. Overall, the first time I saw that and read that, I was like, there's no way that works. When I played it, it blew my mind. <laughs> like, 
<laughs> I don't know if I'm just that simple, but it was so impressive to me. Like, how does somebody even think of that? It's not like anything I've ever seen before mechanically, and it works so well. There's also a lot of variability. So even if you do have a better memory than I do, there are more advanced variants. You can shuffle your deck differently. There's also an expansion, which I haven't personally gotten to play yet, but I'm really excited to once I have the time to sit down and get it to the table. And overall, it's just a really cool game. So if you're a big fan of deduction, if the idea of hidden movement appeals you. If you want to learn more about Shakespeare and history and these historical figures, this game is just dripping with culture. And that's one of the coolest things for me is when a game gets me excited about a topic and works that topic into the mechanics beautifully. So if that sounds appealing to you, definitely check out John Keane's Black Sonata. Number eight on this list is the largest boxed game that I have on this list, and that is Coffee Roaster from designer Sashi. Speaking of games that are dripping with theme, in Coffee Roaster, you are going to be building a bag of coffee beans, putting them through various roasts until it's time to finally brew and construct your final cup of coffee. So the game is played in those two rounds. And upon first reading it, I will admit that it seemed a little bit overwhelming. However, there's so much information in this box about coffee and coffee beans and the process of creating coffee that once I wrapped my head around that, the mechanics fit so well and they were actually very straightforward and the game is very easy to play. Not necessarily to win, but the ease of play is definitely there. So essentially during the first half, you're just pulling out your beans and they're roasting. As you go through, you're trying to manage, okay, do I want to try to brew now? Do I think I have the perfect blend of levels of beans as well as other flavor combinations for the specific cup that I'm going for. And during that second phase, you're going to be pulling them out one at a time and either adding them to your cup or to your tray. Once you have that final cup complete, then you're going to score it based on all of those different things and the flavor profile of the particular coffee you're trying to brew. I'm not a huge coffee fan. My favorite flavor of coffee is free, if at all. So this game's theme didn't necessarily appeal to me, but I have to say the more that I read into it and saw how well it worked with the mechanics, the more that I saw how streamlined but yet clever this game is, I have like a newfound appreciation for coffee just because of that. I think that really speaks to Sashi's mastery of simple yet effective and very flavorful designs, if you will. <laughs> So if you're a coffee fan and want to get into solo gaming or you're a solo board game fan and you like the idea of a really unique bag builder, definitely be sure to check out Coffee Roaster. Game number seven for this list is one that admittedly does not have one of my favorite themes. However, this game overall as a package has one of my favorite table presences of all the games on this list, and that is under Falling Skies. This is a game that started out originally as a nine card print and play, but around the time that I discovered it, CGE announced that they were gonna be releasing a new version with beautiful art from Quanjai Moria. So of course I had to wait for the full package instead of doing a PNP build. Under Falling Skies has a very similar theme to the idea of Space Invaders, where you have aliens descending from a mothership, trying to blow up your base, and you have to assign dice to various technology, energy production, and defense mechanisms in order to shoot them down before they destroy you. One of the main criticisms of this game that got me really nervous when I first heard about it was the fact that it relies too heavily on dice rolls and that it is too lucky. However, I disagree, and here's why. Even though the entire game is based around die rolls, even though there's very little you can do to change those die rolls after they have been set, this game is all about preparation and managing to have different avenues to utilize those dice regardless of what their number is. One of the great things is that even if you get a low die roll, which would give you smaller returns in energy or damage, that low die roll means that the ships are going to descend less that round. However, if you get a high die roll, you're going to be able to do more in your base that round, but the ships are going to descend much faster. So that alone in and of itself is a great mitigation strategy. You can also use dice to advance your excavator in order to open up more rooms to get 
better place in the future. So it's a really interesting time of deciding, do I want to invest big now? Do I want to pull back? Do I want to expand my horizon so that I can do better in the future? What is the timing of ships descending? And overall, because it is all die rolling, like, yes, you could have a game where it is very challenging and it takes longer because you have less die rolls or a faster game where you have more going on more quickly. However, I think overall, regardless of what you get in terms of your die rolls, it always feels like there is a way to manage it and mitigate it from round to round. This game also just has an amazing table presence with the clear little plastic ships, the boards, there's a lot of variability, there's a campaign, there's so much here that Regardless of your particular preferences in games, I feel like this is one that could definitely appeal to a pretty wide audience. This is just a really enjoyable game, and although the theme is not one that necessarily appeals to me personally, the overall aesthetic and presentation and mechanics and how they're all implemented together make this definitely one of my favorites to play when I have the time and space to set it up. So that is Under Falling Skies. And here we have our first micro game of the list, and this is Rove, published by Button Shy Games. Rove is an 18 card wallet game where you will be traversing through different terrain as a little robot, trying to arrange different modules in order to complete certain mission cards. This game is extremely puzzly, and I have to say that it wasn't one that gripped me right away when I heard about it, but once I played it, oh my goodness, it was like, am I allowed to say crack? <laughs> It's so addictive. It's so simple to learn. It's such a tight little game. It's very unique in terms of manipulating things around. Even though I'm not the best at spatial reasoning, I really love games that give me a spatial reasoning puzzle. And while I do love tetraminos and polyaminos and tiling and all of that good stuff, this game gives you spatial reasoning in a much different way because you're just rearranging those cards on a grid. And even though it seems like it would be very easy because of the limited number of movement points that you have on each card and the different combos that you can get by having certain cards in areas and the powers on each card, there's a lot to consider here. This is definitely a game that makes the most of minimal components, minimal table space, minimal time and effort in learning and playing the game, but really gives me a very satisfied, full, huge game kind of feeling throughout the course of playing it and when I'm done. So if you're looking for something that really hits all those buttons with puzzly spatial reasoning in a very compact and very satisfying package, be sure to definitely check out Rove from Button Shy Games. Next up on the list is one of my newest acquisitions, so there may be a little bit of recency bias here, but I mean, that's pretty much this whole list, and that is The Brambles from designer John Burton. This is a game where thematically, you are going to be trying to save children from these evil brambles that have corrupted the town. So in order to do that, you're going to be going through your deck of cards and collecting sets, almost like poker hands, based on the suits of the cards, as well as the numbers. So you're looking for straights, same number, same color. There are bigger combos where you can use up to six cards to defeat any two brambles, and the stronger combinations of cards are going to allow you to defeat stronger level of brambles. So your goal is to defeat all of the brambles before your deck runs out. This is a game that admittedly the price tag was a little high. It was a little harder to get because it is published through The Game Crafter, which if you're not familiar, is a company that helps people self-publish games and they print to order. I'm always a little bit wary, even if I know I will enjoy the game. The price tag is always a challenge for me to get over personally, but I do really enjoy supporting more independent designers and this game, oh, I'm kicking myself for not just doing it when I had the impulse the first time. I sat on this in my cart for such a long time because I was like, well, you know, value and et cetera, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. Scratch that. BS. I don't want to talk about it. I'm just so glad that it's here in my collection now. John procured the art from various different paintings from the 14 to 1800s and each suit has its own theme, like dreams, monsters, etc, etc. I know that the aesthetic is not for everybody, but for me, it was, ooh, it just hit home. The word that comes to mind when I think about this game in terms of its presentation, in terms of its mechanics, is 
alluring. It's dark, it's mysterious, it's got that vibe where you don't know what's coming up on each next turn of a Bramble card or your deck. It really kind of puts you a little bit on edge, but it's so satisfying. I grew up playing solitaire card games. That is definitely something that for me, the nostalgia hits hard with this one. It was the same with Oniram when I first discovered that game. And this one does it in such a cool package. One of the things I had heard about this game when I was first researching was that it felt a little too lucky. Now, whether or not that's true, I'll have to see with many, many more plays, but I have to say in the times that I've played this so far, there I can definitely see how it would happen, but I think more often than not, you're going to have a pretty balanced out deck. And if you get unlucky at the beginning, that means that your cards are gonna line up later on and become more lucky. So there is a little bit of push your luck with which cards you wanna trade in at what time. And if you wanna tackle larger brambles first or later, but overall, this is just a really unique game and its presentation and the mechanics are relatable enough. So if you like card games, if you like this aesthetic and this theme, I would definitely say, do do not hesitate to pick this up if you get a chance. And that is The Brambles by John Burton. Coming in at number four is a game that will probably be no surprise if you've been here before, and that is Grove which is soon to be published and released by Sideroom Games. Rope, in case you're not familiar, is the sequel to Orchard, which was actually on my top 10 solo games of all time list that I released last year. Grove is very similar to Orchard in that you have a deck of nine cards that you're going to be overlapping, trying to match different trees, which will increase pit values on your dice that mark the growth of the fruit in your orchard. Grove takes that and amps it up to the next level. It adds groves, which have blank sides, which give you more flexibility in planning while you're placing your nine cards. And each of the cards on the back has a unique objective. Instead of having a beat your own score, Grove now includes an actual number for the challenge mode that you are trying to achieve. And it takes all the simplicity of Orchard and has really refined it. I was worried I would prefer Orchard more or that I would prefer Grove more, but honestly, because of that target number, I don't know what it is. It just gives me a little different feel. Grove is a lot crunchier than Orchard is, even though they're almost identical in their gameplay. I'm still waiting for my published copy of Grove to be coming in, fingers crossed, hopefully sometime soon. For now, I've really been enjoying my print and play. So I do have a video on that as well as on Instagram posted some tips about how I made my build if you're interested in checking it out. If you are also a fan of Orchard and haven't tried Grove yet, be sure to do so because I think both of them are just such fantastic games overall and I'm really really pleased with the updates that Grove has made on this already fantastic game. For the number three slot on this list I have another game that is albeit not my favorite genre of games but that is Lux Eterna. The flavor of this game is that you are lost in space, trying to repair your ship in order to be able to get home. You're going to be drawing up a hand of multi-use cards and each card you will program in from round to round to either take damage, get energy, manipulate die values, and repair your ship. I love multi-use cards. I love the retro vibe of this game, even though I'm not a huge fan of space games. And this was actually the first official game that I created a video for on this channel because once I played it, I was just thinking, oh my gosh, like, where have you been all my life? This is fantastic. And I think it's a super underrated gem. I know that more recently they've put out a second edition. So I'm really glad to hear that distribution is now here in the US and more around the world globally, because when I first was interested in this game, it was like impossible to find here. So I'm very glad to hear that a lot of people can get their hands on it now. I think the utilization of multi-use cards makes for some really interesting decisions because again, this is a game that's easy to play, hard to master. You're drawing up your cards each hand, you're programming them in, and then resolving whatever is showing on that area of the card. But how the cards work together, the timing of everything, the unique powers of the parts of your ship once they're fully repaired, add a lot of variability from game to game. There are just so many great things in such a small package. And this is one of the games that is super affordable as well and doesn't take up much space on a shelf 
or on a table. It plays very quickly. There's technically you're supposed to play with a timer of like 10 minutes, which I love that speed element, but it plays just fine without it as well if that's something that you are not personally into. This is one that I can see a lot of people enjoying, even if you're not a huge fan of solo games or haven't started playing any solo games yet. So I would definitely recommend checking out Lux Eterna if any or all of that appeals to you. Coming in at the number two slot is probably the most gorgeous game on this list, and that is Canopy from designer Tim Eisner. In Canopy, you are going to be drafting cards from one to three piles. However, the cards are going to be face down, so there's a little bit of a push your luck element. Each time you pass a pile, you're going to put a card down on it, which means that it will make that pile potentially better for your opponent to take. The cards that you collect will have a variety of different things, such as different plants, wildlife, and of course, trees to build your canopy. This game is primarily a two-player game, but it has a solo mode as well as a three and four player variants. I've played it at two, I've played it solo. I absolutely love this game solo. I think it, it's one that again, just hits my brain in such a way that I can't stop thinking about it. I wanna play it all the time. I was very skeptical at first because, I mean, I love Vincent Dutrait's art, but I have been burned in the past from like, ooh, pretty, and then the game just really falls flat. So I was worried it would be the same with Canopy, but I couldn't help myself. I pulled the trigger. I'm very glad I did. The solo version of it for me is better than the multiplayer version because each time you pass or take a pile, you are programming what the solo opponent is going to do on their turn. There's no questions about it. There's no flipping a card to see what the Autonoma does. It's if this, then that. If not this, then that. And so you know exactly what the AI opponent is going to be doing every single turn. So there is a balance with that drafting. There's a tension there of, do I take what's best for me and let this AI opponent take cards that I know it needs? Or do I take something less optimal for my turn to ensure that they don't get that card that they really need? This is a type of solo mode design that just really excites me because it captures the essence of the game and in my opinion for a control freak like me makes it even better because i don't have to worry about what is my other opponent going to do are they going to hate draft me back i just know exactly what's going to happen i can get in there get the cards i need lay it all out it looks beautiful they actually make freaking trees there's a lot of different scoring but it's not too much it's really just the trees different sets of wildlife which gives you slight little powers and set collection of different plants and event cards. Like there's a lot of juicy little things and a lot of variability because it includes even more cards that you can integrate into the game or swap out if you get bored of the original kind of just base core set of cards and how they score and interact with each other. The one thing I will say about this game is it is quite a bit of a table hog, but with how beautiful it is, can you really complain? So if you're looking for a solo game that also works really well at two players, and I'm not sure, potentially at three and four, that has gorgeous table presence and makes really great use of cards and minimal components, definitely, definitely, definitely check out Canopy from Tim Eisner. All right, getting down to it. Drum roll, please. Can you guess what my number one is for this list? I bet you can. And if you can't, then... Be prepared to kick yourself in about five seconds. My number one game on this list of my top 10 new favorite solo games is Ragemore, another 18 card wallet game published by Buttonshy Games. This is a game where you're going to be going through a deck using heroes to defeat enemies and complete different quests. Each card is going to be multi-use in a couple of different ways. On one side of the cards, you'll have your heroes, which you'll add in to form your party. And the other side will have enemies, which you'll defeat, which will trigger events, and which will give you set collection for the items you need to complete quests. This game, I feel, is like my micro game soulmate. I don't know how else to describe it. I love the theme. I love the name. I love the aesthetic. I absolutely love multi-use cards. I love card games. I love small micro games. It doesn't take up a lot of space. It plays in just about probably, I mean, if you have played it as much as I have, I can probably get a game out in like five, six minutes. If I'm in a rush and I just need a quick fix. And overall, it is such a tight little game. One of my first introductions to micro games was The Man in the Forest by Todd Sanders. And the thing that gripped me about that game 
is also present in this. And that's the fact that this is such an elegant design. You really, as the player, have to use a lot of restraint and planning and be very timeful with the limited resources that you have. If you rush in too heavy and complete too many quests, you're gonna run out the enemy decks, which you cannot replace. So if you deplete your enemies too quickly, you're gonna back yourself into a corner. It feels very tactical to where the utilization of your cards the size of your party, the size of your enemies, all of that just comes together in such a way that you really have to have that balance. You really have that tightrope kind of feel that I was talking about with EO and you really have to plan ahead. One of the other things that I think is so cool about Ragemore is that at first, it may seem really random. The first time I played this game, it kicked my ass. I'm not gonna lie, <laughs> but not in such a way where I felt completely defeated. There was like a small glimmer of hope. I could tell that there was a strategy there, that there was a learning curve that I'm like, but if I just play it again, I have an idea of what I need to do better. And after that second play, I was like, but wait, 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 just one more time, just one more time. If I play it one more time, then I'll know, then I'll get it. And I was like, oh, wait, wait, wait. I was even closer. So now I have an idea of exactly what I need to do. And that's something that's super exciting to me, especially with a small package game. There's only so much variability that you can have in terms of limitations of components, in terms of the size of the game, and a game that makes you want to play it over and over and over and over again, just by virtue of there's that much depth within the design and how the elements work together is just, it's genius. And I have such a huge appreciation for Boyan and for this design, both the game design and the actual physical like art for the design. I just think that this is a really shining example of a fully fledged gaming experience in a small package. And this is absolutely my go-to game, my little hit of serotonin throughout the day. So if you haven't already, I would definitely recommend that you check out Rage more. So there you have it. Those are my top 10 solo games that are new to me as of this beginning of 2022. Let me know down in the comments below what your thoughts are on these games or if you have any other new games that you've discovered recently and would like to share with me. I'm always looking for suggestions and I know I've said it a million times. I probably sound like a broken record, but the best part about solo board gaming is not only the games, but the community. So I appreciate you guys for being here, for sharing your thoughts with me and sharing along this journey together. And if you're new, welcome. We're so glad to have you. But that's all the time we have for today. If you enjoyed this video, feel free to leave a like to help it get out to a wider audience and help spread the solo board game love. You can also subscribe down below and click the bell for notifications anytime I do a new upload if you want to see more. Thanks so much for joining me and I'll see you next time. Bye. And that is EO. This game is backwards and I need to restart. <laughs>